Commissioner, dear colleagues, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. At a time when the European economy faces important challenges, it is essential to focus our efforts in measures that concretely boost economic growth, restore confidence and create new jobs. An ambitious trade agenda, including the EU-US TTIP agreement, is a key element in delivering growth and employment. TTIP is a top priority for our Presidency. Considering that the political stock-taking uh, stock took place less than two weeks ago, and that the next round of negotiation, as well as the EU-US summit, will be taking place next month, our debate today is timely and an excellent opportunity to assess the progress already made in the negotiation and to exchange ideas on the way forward. TTIP, the Trans-Atlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, is very important both for the European and for the American economy. Studies have shown that it can grow the EU economy by 120 billion, the US economy by 90 billion, and create a net welfare benefit to families in Europe of over 500 euro per year. It is important to have an open debate and include all relevant stakeholders in the discussion. We have many opportunities to do that. Today, the Greek Presidency has invited business leaders from the EU and the US to discuss the business perspective of the TTIP. I'm delighted to welcome our, part, our panel, led by Mr. Pavlos Chimas, a well-known and distinguished Greek journalist. He's being joined by Mr. Nils Andersen, Group CEO of AP Moller Myers and Vice Chairman of the European Roundtable of Industrialists. He's joined by Mr. Markus Bayer, Director General of Business Europe. He's joined by Mr. Henrik Bourgeois, Chairman of the American Chamber in the EU. And he's joined by Mr. Randall Stephenson, Chairman and CEO of AT&T and Chairman of the Business Roundtable. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to Athens. Uh, Minister Mitarakis, thank you very much for the privilege to participate in this debate among uh, distinguished business leaders about one of the most interesting, important, certainly the most ambitious, and in some ways still controversial issue on the agenda, on, uh, both in Europe and across the Atlantic. Uh, the four speakers are, as you already know, four distinguished business leaders from Europe and the United States. Uh, Mr. Niels Andersen is the chief executive officer at the well-known group Meller Mesk, and he's also the vice president of the European Roundtable of Industrialists. Mr. Markus Bayer. Uh, has a long career both in executive positions and in public office. He has been the chief economic advisor of the Chancellor of Austria, and he's actually the Director General of Business Europe. Mr. Hendrik Bourgeois is the Vice Chairman for Europe for, of General Electric Company, and uh, he's the Chairman of the American Chamber in the European Union. And Mr. Randall Stephenson is the President and Chief executive officer of the well-known AT&T company, and he's also the chairman of the United States Business Roundtable. So, I would suggest that we start with one of our American guests, Mr. St Stephenson, if you don't mind, to take the, take the floor first. 
Of course. Uh, thank you, Pavlov. And I, I also thank you for the invitation here in the Chamber of Commerce for putting this on and, and hosting us. It's an honor. It's an honor to be here and visit with you. Uh, I'm, I'm here wearing a couple of hats, as you heard Pavlov say. I represent AT&T, but I'm here probably more than anything representing the United States Business Roundtable. And trade has become a very, very important issue, as you might guess, for the Business Roundtable. We, uh, we started this year in January, I, I assumed this role in January, and we said that we wanted to get focused as the top companies in the Business Roundtable on four very specific issues. And by the way, the Business Roundtable is 200 of what is largely the, the largest around seven trillion dollars of revenues. Uh, we employ 16 million people and roughly two-thirds of the U.S. R&D is represented by these companies. And so we said what we want to do is bring ourselves together with one voice and drive one agenda. And that agenda is economic growth in the United States. And the United States, we believe, has been experiencing subpar growth for some time now. And that growth, we believe, is a function of low. So as we try to focus on what are those things that drive the investment, there are four areas. And one of the key four areas is trade. And we believe that if we can get trade stimulated, it will do a tremendous amount of both economic growth, investment, and employment in the U.S. Uh, to that end, we are focused on specific. Thank you very yeah. much. To that end, we're focused very specifically on making sure that we get the president his trade promotion authority to execute trade deals with, first and foremost, Europe, the TTIP uh, agreement, and second is Asia. And what I would tell you is there is general uh, strong agreement in the United States that we need to get this trade promotion authority to the president so he can negotiate these deals. There is strong general bipartisan support. Unfortunately, in the U.S., to say there is strong bipartisan support and to say there is strong momentum does not always go together. And so what we are trying to do as a business community is create the momentum in Washington, D.C., behind trying to get this done. Step one, trade promotion authority for the president and the administration. Uh, I have uh, visited with the President personally. He is committed. You heard him in his State of the Union address in January state that this was a priority for him. Then you heard him, unfortunately, the very next day, Harry Reid come out and say, now is not the time. Don't be alarmed by that. I, I do believe that if we can get, catch the momentum, we can get this done. We would like to get this done, the Trade Promotion Authority, this year. But it is a major, major push for us. I would tell you that something with Europe, with uh, the European Union and the U.S. being the two largest consumer markets in the world, there is a very powerful thing to be done by creating a trade deal between these two areas. NAFTA was our latest example of this, the North American Free Trade Agreement. We are 20 years past that, and I would say, looking back, that has been nothing but a success. I believe something just as powerful could be done with a trade agreement with the European Union. So that is what our, our uh, emphasis is and what we're trying to accomplish. Well, thank you very much, sir. Um, let me, uh, I would like to ask Mr. Anderson to, well, thank to, you. to take the floor. All right, uh, I, I will try to help you with the mic. Is everyone comfortable with the sound? So and so. We'll try to make it better. Do you want me to switch off this one? Or? Yes, I think it would be better. Okay, whatever. And, and will we use it during the debate after your okay. introduction? So, uh, my name is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, ministers, commissioner, uh, my name is uh, Nils Andersen, and uh, I've already been presented as a group CEO of AP Muller Mask. Uh, we've been, uh, we are the largest shipping company in the world. Uh, we are doing quite a bit of the trade between, uh, transporting quite a bit of the trade between US and Europe, which is, of course is the largest uh, trade area in the world by quite a margin. Um, 
And we actually been transporting goods across the Atlantic uh, for more than 100 years, Un uninterrupted, even by World War II, we were still sailing. Uh, so we have a long, uh, long tradition for be having an interest in this, uh, in this trade. Um, I'm also the vice chairman of the European Roundtable, which is a similar uh, organization to the uh, Roundtable of uh, American industrialists. Uh, we are a private, uh, private uh, group of, uh, of CEOs and chairmen uh, heading 50 of the largest companies in, in Europe. We represent a large large, uh, vast amount uh, of uh, people, in workplaces in Europe, a very large proportion of the R&D in Europe, uh, and of course also a, a huge amount in terms of share of the global trade uh, coming out of Europe. So, uh, so that's why I'm here today. If you look at the, uh, at the trade between uh, Europe and the US, it is, uh, it is as I said before, it's the largest uh, trade in the trade uh, uh, corporation in the world, the most significant one. It's also one that has been relatively less protected. It's a relatively free trade, at least when you look at, uh, look at uh, industrial products. But still today we have a tariff level between the two trading areas of approximately 4% uh, of, uh, of the value of goods. And more importantly, we have uh, approximately 20% uh, cost, additional cost of what we call barriers to trade uh, on trade between the, the countries. It's uh, significantly more for agricultural products, but even for industrial goods, it ranges between uh, 10 and 20 percent. And um, there are many figures in the room, and some have already been mentioned by the Greek trade ministers. So I'm not going to go all too much into detail, but the figures we get from economists and analysis and trying to sum it up is that there is a, a GDP growth reserve uh, by reducing this gap uh, by approximately half. Uh, the, the growth reserve could be somewhere between half and a full percent uh, of GDP, which is, uh, which is very significant. In addition to that, of course, there are a number of advantages uh, for the two regions in getting closer together, uh, such as better protection of intellectual property rights, uh, the ability to set global standards, which is probably, I mean, s setting standards across the two areas are probably more, more difficult uh, than, than uh, or reducing tariffs. But it is also, even though it's more difficult, it is also much more important for the, you can say, for the significance of this deal, because standardization across two such important uh, trade, trade areas means that the in industries and, and, the tr and the standards that are being set uh, will be, uh, will be uh, industrial practices uh, across the world, at least with a much greater likelihood than if we try to go it individually in the two, uh, in the two regions. So there is quite a lot, of, a lot of upside in having a very tough look at this and working hard to really get standardization across the two regions. I think it's very important, uh, we, we're all aware that there's, there's mounting opposition and a lot of discussion going around about uh, the value of TTIP. Uh, some try to uh, frame it as a ploy of big industry. Uh, and my point here today is that I, I believe this is absolutely wrong. Um, the, the, among the industrial players, uh, we, will, we will have winners and losers. The most competitive will always get most out of a bigger trade area, and the least competitive will lose some protection. So this is a measure that will increase competitiveness of the entire block, and the, it will also increase competition between the industries uh, across the Atlantic. We believe that this is, uh, this is very good for the in, Above all, for the consumers in Europe, we believe that the main part of the uh, or the main effect of this uh, this new trade pact will be a reduction in cost for the European and the American consumer and increase in quality. This is more important than the benefits than the uh, uh, that the industries will get out of it. But needless to say, when we get a bigger tr area to trade in, we can improve our products, we can get more economies of scale, which will be very useful for our ability to compete 
uh, globally in the areas also outside the US and Europe. So a lot of opportunities in this and the most opportunities will probably come from the most difficult part which is setting the right standards, agreeing the, the right uh, 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 protection of intellectual uh, property rights and so on. Uh, but that's where the upside is. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now, Mr. Bourgeois. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, first of all, for the invitation. And thank you to Notis Mitarakis for uh, having us here. It's a delight to be able to participate in the discussions. Um, I, the point I would like to make is that for, uh, my name is Henry Bourgeois. I'm the president of the American Chamber of Commerce to the European Union. So our organization consists of multinational companies of US parentage that are vested in and committed to Europe and the European Union. And to be very frank with you, TTIP for us is not a nice to have. TTIP for us is a must have. It's a must have for a very simple reason. Uh, today, the levels of cash that non-financial corporates in the United States have have reached unprecedented levels. Recent analysis suggests that uh, US corporates, non-financial corporates, have approximately $1.5 trillion on their balance sheets in cash. And every day, hundreds of executives in the United States need to decide how they're going to make that cash work. Are they going to use that cash to do a stock buyback? Are they going to use that cash to pay out a dividend to their shareholders? Are they going to use that cash to do some mergers and acquisitions? Or are they going to use that cash for investments, for capital expenditures? And are they going to use that cash to do investments in Europe or elsewhere? And so in order to promote investments in Europe, TTIP is of extreme importance. You know, Executives make these investment decisions on a, on a wide variety of criteria. Um, and having the ability to make an investment in a region, in a country, where the costs of doing business are relatively lower, where there is no duplication of regulatory requirements, is one of those critical factors that executives take into account when making investment decisions. And that is why, for an organization like the American Chamber of Commerce to the European Union, TTIP is of utmost importance. Now, in order to get there, there are a number of very important hurdles that needs to be jumped over. Uh, one of those hurdles is, and it has already been mentioned, is the fact that increasingly uh, stakeholders and public opinion and civil society is uh, concerned, has uh, mistrust and uh, and, and is fearing the negative effects of uh, a transatlantic trade and investment partnership agreement. And I think that the, the private sector, Amcham EU certainly, uh, and, and others in the private sector are doing what they can to alleviate those concerns, to talk about the benefits of TTIP, uh, to uh, explain what the, uh, the advantages are, and to also engage with civil society. Uh, to engage with those who, who, who have raised concerns. Uh, and my point is, it is not only the task of the private sector to do this, but it's also the task of national governments to do this. Because national governments are those who are elected and are closest to their voters and the citizens, and who can you know, engage with uh, their citizens, provide information to the citizens about the benefits of TTIP. So that's the first point I wanted to mention. And then, the, and then the, a final point, is uh, we need to make sure that we drive pragmatism and pragmatic approaches in this whole complex initiative. Uh, and I would encourage the negotiators and you know, political leaders to focus on those aspects of TTIPs that will drive greater economic outcomes, that will have greater impact on employment uh, in order to uh, obtain uh, as much as benefits as possible from this initiative. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> now, so the fourth closing intervention would be by Mr. Marcus Behrer. And then the floor is open for your questions, remarks, and for the debate. Thank you, Mr. Behrer. Thank you, Chairman. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first let me thank you for inviting us. My name is Marcus Barra. I'm the Director General of Business Europe. You know we represent the European business via our member federations and directly in Brussels. President of our Greek member, Dimitris Daskalopoulos, is here. Happy to see him. Um, TTIP for us is, without any doubt, one of our top three priorities. I mean, this is something that really matters. I would add to what Hendrik said, it's not a nice to have, it's a must have. Of course, we are starting to face a number of criticism in the wider public, in the debates. We are all, I think, ready to actively address this and constructively debate this. I think this is very important. But let me be very clear about the reasons why we really support this agreement. I mean, first, we all think that this is maybe the best chance we have to scale up the growth path on both sides of the Atlantic. And uh, I would agree with Niels Andersen, of course, there will not only be winners. I think it's not, you can never say there's only winners. But the ratio seems to be better than in many other agreements because we rarely had such a huge support from all sides of our membership on an agreement. So the ratio seems to, the overall ratio seems to be very good and we also think it will really benefit the consumers on both sides of the Atlantic. So overall, it seems to be a no-brainer. Of course, if we go into more details, it's getting more complicated, but uh, you know all the figures, I will not repeat them. We know that it will heavily benefit to growth, to jobs, to trade. But we also know we will only be able to harvest these positive results if we are able to come to a deep and comprehensive agreement. And of course, and we are seeing this at the time being, uh, the honeymoon phase of the negotiations seems to be over, which is normal. At one stage, you have to come to the real stuff. And I think this is the phase now where the negotiators on both sides of the Atlantic will need our support and maybe sometimes also encouragement uh, to go on in this deep and comprehensive agreement. And this is about tariffs. Of course, tariffs are overall relatively low between our economies. But we also know that uh, given the huge uh, quantities which are traded, this is still an enormous amount of money. And this is about value chains, and Niels Andersen stressed it, which will at the end make both of our economies more competitive in the world. This is very much about regulatory convergence. This is maybe the most important piece because what we have to eliminate is this necessity to produce different products for both sides of the Atlantic, to have different designs, and so on and so on. But what we will have to prove, and I think this is something we will all have to do together, is that it is not a race to the bottom, like some say, but it's a race to the top. It is something which will make us all stronger. It's about public procurement, and this is something I say very clearly, uh, for us, on the European side, it will be important to get something in public procurement in order to be able to really sell this agreement. And it's also and very much about investments. We know this. When we integrate the two largest, most integrated, most advanced economies in the world, of course, it is very much about investment. We agree that it was right to have this consultation phase on the investor-to-state dispute settlement. Of course, the pressure had to be taken out, but we also think this public consultation must not be hijacked and deterred into a referendum, because we think this would be a very difficult step, because if we allow for this and if we allow to get pieces we would need kicked out of the negotiations, this would be a starting point, and what is next? Next, we would have a referendum on regulatory convergence and so on and so on. So yes to the consultation, but no to turning it into a referendum. Last but not least, of course, uh, needless to say, it is about expectation management. And I think this is something, and I may, might end on this, what both sides of the negotiators have to understand. It is not just one more agreement. It is the agreement, and it has to, we all need the weapons, the arguments to win the public debate at the end of the day and we have to under, we have to explain this is the agreement of major strategic importance 
There are things, and let me just stress the intellectual property, where only together Europe and the United States will be able to spread our view over the world. But it is very much about, as I said, expectation management, and this means that we will also need the progress in order to explain to people that it will be beneficial at the end. We will fight for this up to the very last moment, and I think we can succeed, but we will need the arguments, and therefore I think, and this is maybe a message I wanted to give to our friends from the US side, uh, I think also the negotiators uh, in Washington will have to understand that we will need decent offers in order to defend this agreement also to the wider European public. And then I think we'll be able to really achieve something. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. So, here we are. What I propose is that if there, is, if there are any questions or brief remarks from you, please go ahead with them. And in the meantime, I have, there's the obvious question that I would like to, to put, I, especially from the European side, concerns or objections to this treaty, uh, to this pact, do not concern its economic importance or its impact on growth. Concerns are focused mainly on the, the change in regulations. There's a concern whether the transatlantic trade and investment pact will result in lowering standards, guarantees, consumer protection, safety, these kinds of things. So how do you address these concerns? This is a question that I would like you to to, 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 to respond to. Hmm? Yes, sure. Well, thank you very much. Um, the way I would address this is I think it's perfectly achievable to do both. Both what I mean is to use TTIP as an engine for growth and employment because at the end of the day, you know, governments, uh, there are not too many measures that governments can adopt today that drive growth and employment that are not austerity related and that do not draw upon public finances. And so promoting trade and TTIP is one of the very few things that governments can do today. But, but I believe, and we at Amchami, you believe that we can uh, promote trade uh, and investments and at the same time preserve uh, European values uh, and, and European uh, regulatory protections. Uh, first of all, because this agreement is not about elim eliminating them, uh, but it's trying to find ways to make European regulations compatible with regulations in the United States, which is very different. Uh, so that would be my first answer. And my second answer is I think we need to debunk the myth that the United States is the Wild West with respect to regulations. That in, for some reason or the other, that all regulations have lower standards lower standards of consumer protection, lower standards of environmental protection, uh, lower standards of a variety of other protections than in Europe. This is, this is a myth. There are a number of examples, for instance, in the financial services world, where I would argue US regulations are, are a higher standard. That is, by the way, one of the reasons why the current US uh, agencies are not in favor of including financial services in the TTIP because, in their view, American standards are higher than European standards. The same thing could be said about environmental regulations. I work for an American company and I can assure you that the level of fines, the levels of liability are not only related to litigation but as a result of statutory requirements in the United States is extremely high. And so we need to be very careful about making general broad comments that simply because we include non-tariff barriers in the form of regulatory uh, compatibility that somehow that would automatically result in a uh, reduction of protections for European citizens. And TTIP can achieve growth and maintain a protection of its European citizens, consumers, etc. at the same time. No, thank you. 
Would someone else like to add a comment on that? Yeah. Well, I think this is, this is one of the points, and I, I touched it in my initial statement. Uh, well, of course, we all will have to speak up. We're working on this also to have companies speak up to talk about advantages, to explain to people why it is beneficial. This is one thing. The other point we will have to manage to explain that difference, different does not mean better or, or worse. I mean, it is about coming to a system where we acknowledge that certain standards, levels might be similar. But I think it's very important to say as well, this is not about undermining the autonomy of the national legislator. Nobody plans this and, and this is not what's going to happen. I mean, there's a lot of polemic out there. We have to address this. We have to debate it. But this is not about undermining uh, the autonomy of the national legislator. So what we will have to do is to, to keep explaining this. We are working on Q&As to, to make sure that all our members also respond to this debate. And, and we will have to lead this debate uh, publicly and in, in, in all private dinners we will be we will be invited to. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Well, I think one thing you could add actually is that uh, from the European side, one thing is standardizing across the, uh, the US and, uh, and Europe. Uh, of course, we also have still quite a bit of work to do in relation to getting the internal market fixed. So that, so that has taken quite a long time. So it's not an easy process. It will take a lot of, uh, a lot of discussions and and a lot of sacrifices, but the upside is just immense. And as uh, was said from the American side also, the, there are a lot of perception about quality, about safety standards and things like that, and we just have to accept that we'll have an open debate about that. We have to compromise, and, uh, and standards are very high on both sides of the Atlantic in most industries, at least all the industries I know about. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe one more word mm -hmm. because it's a debate we very much have with the trade unions, and, and which is an important thing. I think we have to look at the world from a global level as well, and uh, it is only together that we'll be able to maintain a certain level of standards. I mean, the US and Europe together will be able to maintain a high level of standards in a number of things. If we are not able to, to team up the, the, the probability that our standards will prevail in the world is lower. I think this is a message we'll also have to have. I'm having trouble hearing all the comments. The speakers were pointed out, so we're all up here fighting, trying to hear what each other is saying. But my, my reaction to this issue, and I've, I keep hearing this one bubbled up, that uh, the difference in standards and the, the difference in uh, various protections and regulations will be the difficult part of getting something done between the two areas, the EU and the United States. And I, I actually don't believe that's going to be such a big issue. And I, I'll go back to the example I gave in my opening comments, and that is NAFTA. I mean, if you believe there weren't significant differences between Mexico, Canada, and U.S. as regards to each of these issues, then you're, you're, you're missing the point because there are major differences culturally and so forth to get that deal done. But because there was political will and leadership on each side trying to drive this through, you are able to work through these. And I believe that the EU and the United States are far more aligned as it relates to culturally, cultural issues and, and environmental and safety and protection issues than even Mexico and the U.S. were. And so I do believe this is something that if the political and the business will, and I do believe business plays a very important role in this, but if the political and business will is here, that these are the kind of issues we can get past and, and compromises can be reached to make this happen. It's only been asked. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Alexander Stubb, uh, Minister of Trade and European Affairs of Finland. I would like to give one comment and then pose two questions to the panel. Uh, the comment is linked to standards. I think there the argument is very simple. We are, together with the US, 50% of the world economy, and the choice is do we want to have European and American standards or do we want to have Chinese standards? I mean, it's really, at the end of the day, is as simple as that. Now, my two questions, the first one is on communication and the second one is on investment protection. On communication, I think 
this is a really tough case. On substance, I'm not too worried. But look, we on the political side, we're grappling with people who are anti-European, who are anti-American, who are anti-free trade, and who are anti-globalization, and who are anti-multinational corporations. So it's an uphill battle for us to try to make the argument why this TTIP, EU-US free trade agreement, is a good one. My question to you is, how would you communicate the benefits uh, of this treaty? Now, my second question is on investment protection. There's a lot of mayhem around this particular issue. We all know there are about 3,000 around them. Uh, of them around the world. We know that there are about 500 cases. We know that Karel de Gucht, our commissioner, has taken a little bit of a time out because of the discussion on this. What is your experience with investment protection agreements? So two questions, communication and then investment protection. Thank you very much. Thank you very much both for your comment and your questions. Who would like to answer first? Mr. Anderson. Well, I think the, the issue of investment protection is something that has been driven for years uh, under the WTO, and I don't think there are huge problems, as you said, between America and, uh, or, or the US and, and Europe. I think that will be the least of the problems. I think in, in terms of communication, I think really the big issue is not so much the industrial products. I think most people will buy uh, the... Um, the, the Randall's argument that, that industrial products in the U.S. are good, industrial products in Europe are good, and, and there's probably not that much difference. I think it's more probably going to be an issue in the whole agricultural sector, and I guess the trick is here to, to convince the consumer in Europe, uh, and, and probably in the U.S. the same thing, but in particular in Europe, from my point of view, that they will get more money available for spending, for this, this is a real opportunity to create wealth for the average European consumer. That is the upside. It is the other upside is that this will enable European corporations to create more jobs, which is another important upside. And these are, this is really, I think, what is in it for the European uh, electorate. Um, the, the danger is, of course, that the, that the consumer and the voter is being hijacked by by, by, you can say, political interest or populist uh, statements on, and I think the risk is basically in the agricultural area. So I think we have to be very careful that this, uh, this debate is not hijacked uh, for, for that purpose. If you want. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, you're totally right. Communication is the key thing. We are, we are thinking about this a lot. We are, we are planning to have a series of uh, of debates, of conferences, rather going out to the capitals, because uh, it's not so much in Brussels that we have to convince people. Uh, we try to motivate uh, our companies as well, of course, to speak up. And it's, it's a tough day-to-day -day fight. I mean, it's about uh, having an article in some newspaper and reacting to it, finding somebody who writes another article. It's about giving the right arguments to all our constituency, and it's a fight we want to take up. Uh, we're working on, 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 on concepts, we start to roll it out uh, and I think we can only do all together. On investment, I think the company side has been very much uh, tackled by Niels Anderson. Just one thought which adds to what you also said on the standards. I mean, I think beside the fact that we will need this to protect certain investments and we have it in a number of uh, treaties as you, as you mentioned, there's also the strategical side, how will we be able to, to ask the Chinese to embed such, in the, such a mechanism and agreement, we, might, we, we will start to negotiate with them if we're not able to have it in the agreement uh, transatlantic. Okay. Mr. Stephenson, I would like to hear from you, especially on communicating, because you have an, a reputation for communicating. I've been following your It Can Wait campaign, so. We have set a standard I cannot meet. Uh, on the communication side, I, I think this is really critical, and your point is well taken. And the BRT, we are initiating activity around exactly this, that we have to communicate the benefits of trade. It's absolutely critical that not just the political class, but the populace at large understands the importance of trade. 
And to that end, we're putting together a lot of detailed information that can be consumed by the average individual. And it's really, the story is rather basic. And in the United States, and I suspect in Europe, these numbers are very similar. But in the United States, one in five jobs in the United States, 20% of all the jobs in the U.S. are supported by international trade. That's a significant number. And more importantly, those jobs, that one, those one in five jobs, the wage rate is at least 20% higher than other jobs in the United States. If you look at those areas that are supporting trade, the growth in employment, the economic growth, they are multiples of what you see in non-trade associated jobs and businesses and economic growth areas. And so there is a compounding effect here that we think is very, very important. We also think that it's very, very important that the respective political class in, in each of these areas understands the significance of this. So at the BRT, we are taking advantage of big data. and. Uh, each of the businesses, the large businesses in the U.S., we know how many people we are employing that are supporting trade in congressional district. We know how much investment is supporting trade in each congressional district. And we know which congressperson is supporting trade. And so we're going to be very active in communicating at the, at the grassroots level employees of these respective companies communicating to the political class the importance of a trade deal. We think this is going to require grassroots momentum to keep this moving forward. And so we're going to be engaged at a very, very grassroots, low level, but we're going to be very loud in terms of the importance of trade. And uh, we're going to be engaging other constituents as well in doing this. But this one is, is one that I, I, I made a comment in a meeting very similar to what I said in my opening comments about NAFTA. And I said, 20 years after NAFTA, the results are in, and the results are unequivocal. NAFTA has been a success at every level. And people step back and say, how can that be? I mean, the rhetoric has been so strong about the anti-jobs impacts associated with NAFTA. And it tells us, businesses, we've done an abysmal job of communicating just exactly what kind of economic multipliers, job multipliers, and investment multipliers have come as a result of a free trade deal with our partner south of the border. So I, I believe in Europe, we're going to have to be very active. You're going to have to be active in the United States. We are going to have to be active, and I will say it again. It is a function of leadership and political will to get this done. And if we don't get the political class fully endorsing it behind this, it will go nowhere. Well, thank you, sir. Would you like to add a comment to that, or let me pass to the next, next question? Maybe the next question. Uh, so you, yeah, and then you. Go, go ahead. Please. Uh, good morning. I'm Bruno Massanz, the Portuguese Minister for Europe. Uh, on, I, I can report from Portugal that uh, the stakeholders are very much mobilized in favor of TTIP. Uh, you have to make uh, uh, information available to them. And of course, in trade negotiations, lots of information are restricted. So it's our role to, to make sure that, uh, that we communicate what can be communicated. But of course, people need information. Uh, now, my question is on investment. And it's, it's a point about TTIP that I'm still uh, working with and trying to understand. How exactly can TTIP foster investment, transatlantic investment, and in particular, American investment in Europe? And some of our countries are very interested in that. Um, and I've, I've heard different theories. First, market access. But my understanding is market access is already pretty easy. Uh, investment protection, I'm not sure it's that important because investment protection is already pretty high in Europe. Is there an American company that doesn't invest in Europe because uh, it's afraid of expropriation or anything like that? I very much doubt it. Uh, is it trade effects? global supply chains, uh, the ability to export back to the US, suppliers in Europe. What exactly are the effects and what's the size that you expect uh, of, of these effects in terms of fostering American investment in Europe? Thank you. Mr. Bourgeois, I think it was tailored for you. Um, well, I guess I tried to address that question in my opening remarks. Um, I, I think TTIP would generate uh, a positive attraction for further investments because it would send a signal to American investors that Europe is open for business, that Europe is not only about fragmentation 
Uh, Europe is not about complex regulations, but that there's a genuine desire from Europe as a, as a trade community to engage with the United States and to make it easier for U.S. companies to invest. Um, so I, I do think it's going to have a, a very important, which is not very often talked about, but a very important psychological impact in the boardrooms in the United States. It will put Europe back on the map and back into the discussions, because to be honest with you, Europe has suffered a lot uh, from visibility and, and reputation as a result of the crisis and credibility. So, you know, sending that positive signal would be the first thing I would say. Secondly, I think uh, it's not only about investments, it's also about increasing exports. You know, a company like GE exports more from our European manufacturing plants to the United States than vice versa. Uh, and so the reason, one of the reasons why we have invested so much in Europe and why we will probably continue to invest in Europe and more if we can is because Europe is a location where we manufacture products that we also sell outside of Europe. Uh, and, you know, selling products also into the United States is very important to us because we need to compensate for the downward pull of domestic demands in Europe, which we have, which we have witnessed in the last five years. Uh, you know, there's less products leaving our factories for European markets today than, than, than five years ago. So we need to find ways to compensate and, and boosting exports is, is, is one important factor in this. And then last but not least, which is a point I think people also tend to overlook, is that trade is not only about boosting exports, it's also about smart imports. And so, uh, you know, a transatlantic trade and investment partnership would promote, I believe, uh, the, the import of products and goods and raw materials in particular. I'm thinking about you know, natural gas, which is critical for European competitiveness and critical for a lot of industrial players in Europe. Uh, and so a TTIP would facilitate the import of natural gas into the European market. And there again, you would have a positive impact on competitiveness of European companies and European-based companies. Thank you. Would you like to add something, or I have another question? Yes, sir. Thank you. I am Amedeo Tetti from Italy. Uh, some days ago, people from American Embassy told us that in Italy, only 11.5% of people knows about TTIP. And I don't know other average in Europe, but when I ask them, what is the figure in US? They say less than 11.5%. What, what is your opinion about, you know, how to improve this figure? Thank you. Just 11? Well, has it been measured in other countries in Europe? I don't know. Maybe not. Well, I think it's how many Well, I mean, talking about communication, of course, we communicate a lot with our members. And, and it turns out that, once again, I mean, Europe is not, not, not not totally the same, so this means we will have to address this debate differently uh, in all member states, because you have a different debate in Germany, where it's very much based on this spying thing. In Italy, it's true, it, apparently, that the, that the awareness is relatively low so far, which uh, is not only a bad thing, because you have less of the polemic debates you have in other member states, you have other stories to address in France. So I think what is important is is to really address the debate like it is in each and every member state together with the help of the companies and federations which are on the ground and to come to a tailor-made message in every member state. And I don't, I, I'm not sure whether, whether the overall goal is to make sure that everybody knows what TTIP is. I think the overall goal is to, to, to bring through the message to those who are interested that this is a positive thing and coming back to what has been said by Randall, to prove especially that it's creating jobs. And, and this is what we try, and this is the hardest thing, also to go to the SMEs and say, you must say in your region that uh, some of the jobs depend on the transatlantic marketplace and you would be able to create more uh, if we were able to reduce obstacles. Well, just very briefly, I'm actually not surprised. I think uh, very few people even know about the World Trade Organization, which has been acti active for a very long period, and most people honestly also don't have an interest in it. 
I think the, what is happening at the moment is that we see, instead of the World Trade Organization progressing trade uh, unilaterally, we're seeing a large number of bilateral agreements, and I think it's maybe also a little bit, because we're immersed in it and we find it very interesting, we also assume that the, uh, the, the voters and the consumers in, in Europe and the US finds it interesting. But the reality is I think it's our job to make sure that things go through with a little no as little noise as possible, creating more, more wealth in, uh, in both areas. But we have to be protective of this so it's not, it's not hijacked. But I think that's all we can, we can hope for. Okay. Are people aware about this in the United States? The uh, average person in the U.S. wouldn't know what TTIP was. They wouldn't have the slightest idea. Unfortunately, there is a small vocal group that you know, creates a negative impression around this, and that's what creates the political momentum against it. And so I think that gets back to the question the gentleman asked earlier, and that is, how do you go about communicating the advantages of this? And that's, that's the challenge that we have. But I would, I would venture to guess that if you went around and at random selected 1,000 people and said, what is TTIP? I would suspect 990 would not know. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I, I would be surprised if it were otherwise. And the 10 that did know would probably be split in terms of supporting it or not supporting it. So we, we have a, a challenge ahead of us. But that said, I, I think that we have demonstrated again in the past that we can get momentum behind these types of initiatives and, and get this done. And it needs to start at the political class. And this is also why I've had the microphone three times, and I will end up saying this three times. It's going to take leadership and political will to make it happen. You, uh, yeah. Please, the mic over here. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I am uh, Simon Anastasopoulos, president of the American Hellenic Chamber of Commerce. In uh, Greece, about 99%, I believe, uh, companies fall within the small, medium-sized enterprises. And about 90% of them employ less than 10 people. To answer your question, we are uh, running a survey in Greece with the assistance <coughs> of uh, AMCHAM EU to investigate the awareness and expectation of the Greek business community from TTIP. In the meantime, though, I would like to ask uh, the panel, and especially Mr. Bayer, what, is, what his expectations are on the impact of TTIP on SMEs. Okay. Well, very briefly, I think this is very important because, I mean, we were focusing on tariff and we know that there is some, there's something to gain, but I think especially on, on, on SMEs, the impact will be enormous if we manage to overcome different standardization if, and if we come to regulatory convergence. And then I think the boost the advantages for the SMEs can be much bigger, but of course we have to achieve this. We have to overcome this and we also have to provide for security. Then the, the, the opportunities for the SMEs can be, can be much bigger uh, in this transatlantic marketplace. Well, I also think any opportunity to do more international trade, the world is opening up uh, and, uh, and one of the things which is very costly for SME SMEs is to constantly adapt their already small product production series to a lot of individual markets. So I think the more standardization we can get, the more opportunities for, for small and medium-sized enterprises to participate in global trade. And in particular, again, the, if you look at Europe, Europe is not a great growth environment and there's no expectations, I think, that it will be a great growth area in, in the near future. I think this represents global standardization and, and opening of a world to trade uh, really represents a very big, um, big and important opportunity for the SMEs. Partly for doing it themselves, uh, which the world is much more open to than it was a few years ago uh, because of the internet and for other reasons, but also by, uh, by hanging on to on the, working on the back of the large enterprises that can use more standardized approaches uh, across the world. So, so this should be a very good opportunity to get more growth in Europe and also more exports. Pavlov, could, could I? Yep. 
this is one of the areas I overlooked when we were talking communication. We have to be aggressive at communicating to small and medium businesses the importance of trade. And I would venture to say that Neil's business is no different than mine. And that is, when you look at our supply chain, there are 60,000 small businesses in our supply chain that do business with AT&T every single year. Boeing, Jim McNerney uses the number, there are 40 to, I think 40 some odd thousand small businesses underlying the Boeing supply chain. And I think it's very, very important that businesses communicate very aggressively to their supply chain and that the business associations, the BRTs on both sides of the Atlantic convey the significance of trade to small businesses that are in these supply chains because it really will drive a significant impact and we have seen that again in trade deals we've done in the past so it's a very important issue you bring up Simone. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would like, yes please, we can have one more question. Good morning. Andrzej Dycha from Ministry of Economy uh, from Poland. Uh, so one uh, comment, I fully agree with those saying that uh, this process of consultation is of particular importance not only uh, because of the, of the fact that at the end of the day we will have to uh, ask people what, they, what do they think about uh, uh, the outcome of our work, but it's all, all, all also important uh, because uh, I think that the only guys who know what we need to do, that's our business people. Uh, so the business people can feed negotiators, politicians, the commission, with the uh, very precise information about the barriers and difficulties they have in access to the American market. Uh, and now the question. Uh, during this uh, uh, consultation process in Poland, some sectors are particularly worried about TTIP, uh, namely that the highly uh, uh, energy uh, consumption sectors like uh, chemistry, like uh, steel industry. Uh, so my question is, uh, what would be the impact of TTIP on steel and chemistry industry and what are your expectations about the energy chapter of this agreement, keeping in mind that prices for energy in the uh, United States now, that's uh, half of the prices that we have in European Union, and uh, prices for gas, it's three, four times lower than we, what we are paying in Europe. Thank you for your question. As this, this was the last intervention, I would ask, if any of you have also some final remarks to make, maybe we'll have a round and then we'll give the floor to Commissioner Can I try Edo. to answer the sure, question and sure, then sure. give my sure, closing sure, sure. remark? Um, when I was talking about imports, I was actually referring to that. As, as you probably know, in the United States, there's the National Gas Act that uh, requires uh, companies that want to export LNG outside of the United States, obviously, to have a, a license from the U.S. government. Now, such a license is not required if the country where the natural gas is exported is a country with whom the United States has a trade agreement, which means that if there's a TTIP, uh, exporters of liquefied natural gas, U.S. exporters, will no longer require a license from the U.S. government. Now, uh, that will have, I think, a positive impact on prices of natural gas, which, as you say, are five times higher in Europe than in the United States, with all of the implications for uh, energy-intensive industries. And I think also by increasing diversity of supply, uh, that will have probably a significant um, you know, impact on existing supply arrangements that you know, countries have today with the eastern part of the world and not the western part of the world. So I think it's, it's very important to look at this also from a geopolitical perspective. Uh, and I do believe uh, that, uh, you know, and this, these are not my words, but of John Kerry, that you know, the TTIP can do for, for our prosperity in Europe what NATO has done uh, for our security. 
and you know, getting access to raw materials and natural gas for Europe at more competitive prices, I think would be one of the potential benefits of TTIP. And that's why we need to communicate about it and talk about it. Uh, and that's one of the key uh, potential benefits of it. And in my closing remarks, I would simply say, uh, you know, echo what has been said. Uh, I think that you know, political leaders like yourselves who are convinced about the broad benefits of trade and of TTIP should champion TTIP uh, because if you don't champion it, then vested interest and more narrow economic nationalism will erode this initiative and we will miss an opportunity, an opportunity to generate more economic growth and employment in Europe, which we still very, very much need. So that's what my Thank you very about. much, sir. Thank you. Uh, I think I'd, I'd yeah. rather hear what Neil has Listen, to say on Neil, this one. Yeah. Neil Anderson, please. Okay, I think this is uh, quite a specific uh, question, and, uh, and I would like to, I think, especially pick up on the gas example you mentioned, because this is a very important point in the debate at the moment. The U.S. gas price is around uh, $4, four dollars, uh, per uh, million cubic uh, feet, and the European is around 11 and a half, just to give you very broad figures. There is a lot of debate in Europe on a political side that that U.S. should export its gas, and, and that's all fine and good, but even with transportation costs, we're not going to get down to very low uh, cost, uh, cost of gas in Europe. Maybe you can go down to eight and a half, but you'll not, mm -hmm. you will never be able to close that gap between the U.S. And, the, and Europe as it is at the moment, unless we find uh, big amounts of shale or other kinds of natural gas in Europe. I think this is a fact we have to live with, just as we also will have to live with for quite a while, that we have very high labor cost and we have very high environmental cost in Europe, all things that makes it difficult for us to compete on a global scale uh, with our industries. The, I think the only thing that I can do is to warn against believing that we correct this by not entering into trade agreements, because the only way Europe can overcome this is by being for part of a big free trade area, where we, can, uh, where we can actually export the technologies we have and the, and the great products that European companies uh, produce. The, there will be issues in free trade when someone has much or has dramatically lower cost than you have, but this is something that Europe will have to face under all circumstances. US is not going to solve those problems for us. This is something we have to address ourselves, but the only thing that's certain is that by staying outside, a big trade area or not, not being active in driving this forward, not only will there be winners and losers, but there will be only losers in Europe. We cannot stop this. We don't want to and cannot protect our markets against more competitive imports. So I think this is a different debate. It's a debate about what it costs to source uh, or, or what we allow of fracking and not fracking in Europe. Uh, I don't have an opinion on that, by the way, but, but I think the, the answer is not trying to protect the market, it is trying to open it as much as we can and be competitive on other parameters. Yes. Yeah. Well, just, just to add on this first on the energy thing, I mean, um, I would fully underline this. I mean, of course, this is, this is a critical point. We know that the energy prices are totally different. As I stressed at the beginning, Business Europe has top three priorities at the time being. TTP in one, but of course changing the European energy policy and the approach we're having being another one of these top three, because we are absolutely convinced that we will not be able to reindustrialize Europe without a change in, in energy policy. So I think some steps have been made recently, some steps in the right direction. Is it enough yet? I don't think so. And But I think we also have to underline what Neil said. I mean, the US is not going to solve our problem. We will have to solve our problem on our own. This means we will have to focus more on cost competitiveness and the security of supply, less on climate uh, policy, and we will also have to seize our chances. And shale in conventionals being part of it. So I think we'll have to keep all these doors open, but the, the answer cannot be protectionism. I think a further step into the transatlantic integration will be a major driver of this transformation and this is the way we have to go. And also coming to one final sentence, 
Let's not deal with this agreement as just one more agreement, like I said previously. This is the agreement, this is maybe the mother of all agreements, uh, but of course it is also about handling expectations. So we will have to fulfill these expectations in the public debate and we will have to get the arguments we need to win this debate. And I think, and uh, I add to what uh, Hendrik said at the beginning, this is not a nice to have, it's really must have. Thank you, sir. Mr. Stephenson. Yeah, I, uh, I'll, I'll conclude by repeating something I heard out in the lobby earlier. Ian Livingston, who was commenting that, look, both sides of the Atlantic are trying to eke out you know, 10 percentage points of additional growth. And I, I will tell you in the US, the business community has landed on the idea that the difference between 2% systemic growth in the US and 4 plus percent growth in the US is three things. Tax, tax reform, trade, and immigration. And I think trade is among the top of those three. And uh, anything that we can do to open up trade between these two continents are big multipliers of economic growth and investment, and I think worthy of everybody's focus and effort. I, I would also, just to follow on to something Neil said, as I look at the difference between European and U.S. growth, there are a lot of differences. The U.S. 2% is not terribly exciting, but I think the key differences are telecom and energy policy and closing the gap in Europe on those two issues probably does as much to stimulate growth as anything else you can do and then put trade on top of that and I do think we have some real sustainable economic growth over the next few years but we're going to have to get the political willpower behind this to make it happen. Gentlemen, I would like to thank you very much for your presence here and for your valuable contribution to this debate. I think it was a very interesting uh, debate. It's a rare occasion where four distinguished business leaders were facing an audience of political leaders and political decision makers. makers. And I would like to call Commissioner Karl de Gucht for his final remarks. Commissioner, please. Ladies and gentlemen, participants in this, uh, I have to say, very interesting debate. Uh, this morning, a uh, very useful debate also to uh, hear your views on the transatlantic trade and investment uh, partnership. I think we should avoid TTIP because nobody knows what it is about, you know. So let's uh, talk about the transatlantic trade and uh, investment uh, agreement. If you talk about, uh, when you talk about TTIP, some people think it's an extraterrestrial or something like that. So we have to be careful with that. Because, in fact, um, our public is not only the business community. Our public are all citizens. All citizens, be they business people, uh, employers, the workforce, trade unions, uh, all kinds of interest groups uh, and all citizens are stakeholders in this process and it's to these stakeholders that we should uh, address uh, uh, our uh, remarks. Now, of course, companies are one of the ways that trade policy affects the uh, economy. Um, we as negotiators, we can try to agree on, uh, on tariffs, on services, on public procurement, um, we can make it easier to provide services and uh, reduce regulatory costs in, uh, in an agreement, but finally it's up to uh, those stakeholders and to the businesses, to our uh, workers to make it a uh, success. So all these changes will only really take effect if a company finds new customers or suppliers on the other side of the Atlantic and employs new workers to meet the demand. So it's very important for us to know where you believe that uh, the real bottlenecks are. 
in order for us to tackle them in the negotiations. And this uh, debate was very instructive. And that's why I'm happy to uh, receive your comments as we prepare for negotiations. And that's why it is important to keep up our contacts as the talks progress. We need that reality check, and not only with businesses. May I repeat it with all stakeholders? Because it's not only uh, the companies that uh, represent the picture, it's also the consumers that will buy the goods and services traded under this agreement. It's the workers whose jobs are linked to uh, exports and to imports. It's the farmers whose livelihood will be affected by our decisions, and it's the citizens who are concerned for how the deal might affect the environment, for example, our health and safety uh, norms and standards. We will not be able to negotiate this deal without their advice as well. And that's why the Commission seeks uh, their input through many different channels, including our new advisory group. So it's a little bit unfortunate that today their representatives are not with us. We are, uh, ladies and gentlemen, ministers, uh, entering now the second phase of the uh, agreement negotiations. We know where there is agreement, and we also start realizing where are the difficulties, the bottlenecks, and sometimes uh, very complicated and intricate things uh, to uh, um, unveil. Uh, so we also know more and more uh, the larger areas where there is still work to do across the, all three pillars of the negotiations. First, we have still a lot of work on uh, what is uh, called market access. And that means both sides need to meet our stated ambitions on tariff uh, elimination. It will not be that difficult to eliminate all tariffs, I believe, on, uh, on goods. But um, agriculture, that will be a little bit more difficult. And uh, we will also have to tackle this one. We need uh, to make our first exchange uh, on offers, which is also a very uh, difficult uh, exercise uh, because uh, we are ready to work on what they call a negative list, which means that everything is accepted unless that is uh, prohibited. But then, of course, we need more uh, uh, transparency on, on what is uh, underwater at this moment in time. We need to move forward on public procurement, which is, uh, I believe, uh, the objective of removing discrimination between European and American firms in either of our markets, what they call national treatment, but you know that, especially in the United States, there is this big difference between the federal level and the sub-federal level that will make these discussions not very easy. We also may, uh, need to make uh, progress on rules. <coughs> that means, for example, making progress on, on trade facilitation. Uh, we did it at the Bali Ministerial, but uh, in our relationship between the EU and the US, we are already much further. But we also have to be much further, because uh, we are such a highway uh, of trade. We should uh, have disciplines on state-owned enterprises, not that much because it would be an uh, overriding problem in uh, Europe or in the US, but because it's an overriding problem uh, with a lot of our uh, other trading partners, and we should set together high standards as an example to these uh, other trading partners. And for example, we need agreements on raw materials and energy, where all will benefit from markets that are regulated in a transparent way without trade restrictions. And you know that, especially for Europe, energy is of the essence. Um, so this will be an important part, I believe, of the uh, overall agreement. Third, we also need to get down to work on regulatory compatibility. And I have to say, that once you start digging into this one, into the regulatory, it becomes uh, enormously complex and enormously technical. But you also realize more and more that, is this, that it is of the utmost uh, uh, importance to work on this regulatory compatibility. The landscape, the regulatory com landscape in Europe and in the US are quite different. Um, and for once, I believe that the European landscape is 
less complicated than the American one. Um, there are also a number of demands uh, from the uh, American side that uh, I understand, but that we will have to put into our uh, existing uh, system, and that uh, will certainly uh, uh, need uh, some uh, political steering to do so. Uh, now, what I would like to say on, on regulatory compatibility are a number of things. First, we should not have the illusion um, that we can do it on the basis of mutual recognition, except for a limited number of issues. This is not the same as uh, the establishment of the internal market in the European Union, which we did, in fact, on the basis of mutual recognition. It is different. This is a negotiation between two different societies. But we need to get to a good result, and for that we will need flexibility, but uh, we will also have to be stubborn. Stubborn in the way that we say, look, we have to do this, this is our goal. How we get there probably will be very difficult. It will uh, need a lot of input, uh, political steer, and you name it, but there where we have to go, because I believe that in the longer term, the most important, the real breakthrough in this agreement could in fact be the regulatory compatibility. Not because we would like to impose norms and standards uh, on others, but we shouldn't put ourselves in a position either that others can impose norms and standards on us. And if we are not, let's say, leading in this debate, others will. So this is something that is of the uh, utmost uh, uh, importance and, uh, I believe, uh, in the longer term, the real reward and the breakthrough of this agreement, but it will also be the most toughest one, I can assure you. It does not mean, and let me reassure you, but also the general public, and maybe even more the general public than yourselves, that we are not dumbing down our standards. We are not going to do this. I will not agree, for example, to put hormone beef on the European market or to change our laws on genetically modified organisms. We are going to respect the basic regulations and the basic legislation because they have been democratically decided and uh, there is a large majority in the European public to continue in that direction. But what I'm going to do is to work hard on to find areas like pharmaceuticals, medical devices, cosmetics, others, where we can make a where we can make regulation that has similar objectives and makes them more compatible. <coughs> I have a, a cold, you may already have noticed that. Um, I noticed it also already for two weeks, by the way. Uh, finally, a word on, the, on, on ISDS, Investor to State Dispute Settlement. Now, this is an acronym that uh, six months ago nobody, nobody knew what it was about, you know, ISDS. Um, what it means is, is that uh, there should be procedures in agreements whereby a company if they feel to be uh, unfairly treated by a member state, in this case either the European Union or the United States, can address, can sue, in fact, um, a state uh, before an international arbitrary uh, tribunal. And I know that uh, a large discussion, a very broad discussion is, is going on on this. But I think we should try to focus this discussion and to limit it to what it really is. It's really about trying to find remedies for the existing ISDS agreements that are very hollow, not very defined. Why? Because the kind of problems that we are facing now didn't exist yet. The whole discussion comes from a procedure by Philip Morris against uh, Australia on the uh, packaging of, of, uh, of cigarettes and cigars. And before, nobody knew what this really about, although it happened all the time, you know, and now it has become a public debate. And the risk that there is, but the risk is there because of the existing agreements, is that, for example, uh, it would narrow 
the uh, policy space of member states, European Union or uh, also the United States. Now, what we precisely want to do in this agreement and what we already did with Canada is make sure that the future ISDS agreements will not limit policy space, that they will preserve the policy space, and that will be a real remedy to the problems that might exist at this moment in time. Secondly, we should realize that there are a lot of ISDS agreements in force, you know. Um, the member states in the past have been concluding 1,400 investment protection agreements. 1,400. I didn't read them yet all. And, uh, okay, we will have to do something with it. We will have to bring them into the orbit of the European Union as a result of the uh, Lisbon Treaty that is, by the way, a process that, that will take time. But we should realize that if we don't do anything about this, that the existing agreements with the loopholes in it will continue to exist. They are not going to disappear unless we would come to an agreement with the United States that they disappear all. But I don't think that is going to happen. So we should realize it. Third remark I would like to make, over the last 24 months, the majority of all cases introduced on the basis of this uh, uh, investor to state dispute settlement mechanism are from European origin, 52%. So our companies are interested in this and they are using it. Let me give you a very recent example, that's the Repsol case. That's certainly going to say, uh, to mean something to Jaime, from, uh, the minister from, uh, from Spain. The reason, the very reason that Repsol managed to extract 5 billion euros from Argentina is because of the ISDS provision in the bilateral investment agreement. Eh? That's the real reason, we should realize it. And that kind of features can happen in the future as well. And, and, uh, and a guy, an argument that has been uh, uh, also added in this discussion this morning, it's uh, how can we ask the rest of the world uh, to have uh, ISDS agreements with us and at the same time refusing to have them ourselves. That's a very important political argument, I believe. But the, the, the reason I, I, I wanted to frame this is because, I, and this, this is what I see as, as a major risk for the negotiations, you know, is that all of a sudden, a problem which is in fact rather small and circumscribed is mushrooming. No? It's mushrooming to an extent that uh, we are overwhelmed by it. And I, I think we should be very cautious with that. Night's ISDS, maybe tomorrow something else. Let's try to focus on what is the important in this agreement. It's making an investment and uh, trade agreement between the two biggest economies in the world. And making sure that this big transatlantic economy that will be more integrated even more integrated than it is now, is the world market leader. That's what it is about. That's the future that lies before us with all the stumbling stones that we are going to meet. But that's where we should get. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating. Thank you all and have a good day.